Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast. I'm your host, Brian Hartley. This podcast exists to equip and inspire your heart-centered leadership. Every week, we bring interviews with some of the greatest heart sets and mindsets on the planet. I hope the heartprint of our time spent together is that it creates new possibilities for you and all those you come into contact with. If you'd like to explore what we could make possible for you, then head to abty.co.uk forward slash connect and book in a free 30-minute call to begin our journey together. I just want to express a huge amount of gratitude to our sponsors, Exhale Coffee. I have been a big fan of Exhale Coffee since meeting Alex and the team back in 2022. Exhale is the first coffee to be sourced, roasted and lab tested specifically to maximize its antioxidant and anti-inflammatory potency. An independent lab test has shown that one cup of Exhale Coffee has the same antioxidant power as 1.8 kilos of blueberries or 55 oranges i'm a huge fan and mrs h loves the decaf especially because she knows that exhale use the mountain water decaffeination process which uses only pure glacial water from the highest mountain in mexico and no nasty chemicals Simply head to exhalecoffee.com forward slash A-B-T-Y for your special offer. And lastly, before I introduce this week's guest, please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It would really help us leave a greater heart print on this world. On episode 272, one honor it is to welcome our great friend Larry Levine back to the podcast. Larry is the co-host of the Selling from the Heart podcast and the author of Selling from the Heart Larry is back with his second book, Selling in a Post-Trust World, which you can pre-order using the link in the show notes. And here we go. It's episode 272 with our great friend, Larry Levine. Larry, welcome back to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast. How are you, my brother? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. Always good to see my friend, Ryan. Yeah, come on. It's been about 18 months since you were last on the show. Like, film me in. Come on. Has it been that long? (laughs) It has, man. This, This conversation is well overdue. Like how, how things been, how, how, like what's been going on in your world in the last 18 months? Oh, what hasn't been going on? I mean, obviously there's a, there's a book to talk about, uh, selling from the, you know what? I'm just blessed Ryan, because if, if I look back and I tell this to Daryl all the time, Daryl's my podcast partner. Yeah. I go, I look back at the last seven, eight years and I pinch myself a lot of times because <laughs> this whole movement that we call selling from the heart stemmed out of a podcast ryan yeah yeah, it stemmed out of a podcast that turned into a book that turned into a business that turned into a movement so every single day i wake up and i get to do what just brings me to life and that's Mm -hmm. living out my why which is i believe success happens when i contribute to a greater cause Mm -hmm. so every single day is a new day for me to bring selling from the heart to the forefront so I, i mean what hasn't happened? <laughs> Love that. Well, one of the things that's happened is, um, so when we last spoke, Selling from the Heart has since been put, picked up by a, a major book publisher because um, you were originally, I think, self-published or, or the smaller publisher, which is amazing to get that kind of like industry recognition. And in that book, you know, one of the core principles was about authenticity. And I think one of the things that you've really just hit on was this idea that you started a movement because you first had an idea there was something you're passionate about. And I think because of the success and because of the popularity of podcasting in general, Facebook communities, the intellectual you know, the mind-driven, strategy-based sales people or or business owners, they see podcasts and communities as a extension of the business, right? And and it might look the same, but I want to really put in the front and center how the spirit of a heart-centered leader is very different, is that the you know, we're not creating communities in these podcasts to create consumers and customers. It's it's coming from the heart with love and service as a posture of service, um, which I think makes space for all the characteristics and qualities you talked about in your first book, which is just that authentic, genuine, heartfelt, not just an empty suit. Excuse me. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. There, there's so much gold that you just said to unpack and... You know, I, I'll go back to why the podcast was even started because it's really going to touch on some of the things that, that you had just said. We did this because we wanted to get a message out there in a way that we felt wanted to be heard. Mm-hmm. 
And we had no idea what to expect. Yeah. But it was that act of service. We were doing it because we wanted to change the dynamics and the narrative of the sales profession. Mm, mm. Excuse me. Yeah, all good. For those that can't see, because they're listening to the podcast, Larry is just drunk from a Chelsea football club mug. Like he's just gone. <laughs> we we just had an incredible bonding moment. Not only are we two heart centered leaders, like guys, but he's just drunk from a Chelsea mug. So we've we've just taken our relationship to another level. No, oh, right? <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> excuse me. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I got a little tickle in my throat. <laughs> but it, it's it's this whole we do things here because. We put community first. Yeah, and what's yeah. really interesting about this is when you put in, and you already know this, Ryan, because you got a heart-centered community as well, is when you put it out there in a way that connects not only mind to heart, mm -hmm. you start drawing in a whole different crowd. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've always said this. I've, I've said it a million times. Selling from the heart, people self-select them in mm -hmm. because it, it resonates it resonates to who they are at the core. Mm. And I'm just a massive, massive, massive believer. The more heart you put out there, the more it comes back. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a big Mark Cuban fan. I mean, either love him or hate him. I just love mm -hmm. what the guy's all about. And I remember I'm a big Shark Tank junkie. And I watch all the reruns of Shark Tank. And I remember one time he said this, and it plays out. He said, being kind in business matters. Mm. Being kind matters. Yeah. I, I literally, just before I was um, coming on to speak to you, it's very. I had a meme in my feed that literally says something to the effect of, be ruthless with systems, be kind with people. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a wonderful being, sometimes like, you know, many leaders are, well, this is just me and this is just how I deal with things versus the separation of systems and people. And, you know, even if it's just like the, the, the leadership and management debate 101, you know, you manage systems, you lead people, even that differentiation could be kind of paradigm shift for most people. You, you know, it's, inter it, it's so interesting. There's two words that are near and dear to me. It's connect and relate. Mm. It, it, and I sit here and just reflecting really quick on what you had just said. And if you're a sales leader, you're a sales professional. We're all human beings. Mm. It's about connection. And the only way that you're going to be able to connect and relate to somebody, regardless if you believe me or not, you got to get to their heart. Mm. You got to, you just have to put them in a place of them being comfortable, them being comfortable with you. And I've always said this, the more that, and I'll use, I'll use you, Ryan, as an example, just so I can personalize it with a name. The more comfortable I make Ryan feel about me, the more comfortable Ryan soon becomes. Mm. The more comfortable Ryan becomes when he's around me, the more Ryan opens up. Mm. And therein lies the paradox then, isn't it? So if we want to be able to connect more with other people, we have to connect and open our own hearts. And yes. I think for many well, you know, I come from a background in policing where vulnerability yeah. was not like yeah. welcome. You know, it was leave all that stuff at home in the certainly in the early days. We're talking 2010 kind of era. You know, that was very much separate the two. And, and you know, we, we've got generations of, of, you know, people in business that have been taught leave self at home leave family at home leave half of yourself at home so what, what you're talking about and what you're inviting people into is it's pretty pretty damn scary for for some people who have no idea what is in their heart you know it, it's interesting we had a guest on the selling from the heart podcast this was um earlier this year and she almost said the same thing but we were talking about spirituality and so forth mm -hmm as it relates to selling from the heart. And she goes, isn't it interesting that we could be spiritual in our house, however you all want to define it, but why do we have to leave it at the doorstep when we go to work? <laughs> and I want us, I, I really want us to think about this, whether that be spirituality, whether that be faith, whether that be heart. Yeah. Why do we have to leave this at the doorstep of our house? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, be yeah. so cognizant of what we say when we're in the work environment 
around heart or around spirituality or around faith. Yeah. I've playfully said in the past, there's some scripture that talks about the fruits of the spirit, you know, joy, patience, self-control, you know, some wonderful qualities. And I said, if a man goes fishing and he comes back and he's more patient, loving, self-controlled, fishing is a spiritual activity. <laughs> so I think, and our, and our, so we, you know, I think Rob Bell wrote a book called Everything is Spiritual. And this is this idea that if it lights you up, that's a spiritual thing. If it destroys your soul, that's a spiritual thing. And work and management and leadership and sales and all these interactions we have in a work setting, they are affecting our spirit, whether we choose it or not. We are demonstrating the fruit as a man. There's another scripture that says a man is uh, something about as is what's in his heart. You know, a man is as to the qualities of his heart. And uh, so <laughs> everything, and, and this like links nicely to the very first chapter in your new book, which we'll talk about, which is it's already there. You're already demonstrating and living whatever the characteristics of your heart are, whether that's loving and abundant or whether it's lack and fear and scarcity. You, you are a living byproduct of that. But fortunately, there's an incredible book coming along that you've written, which is going to encourage people to look in the mirror first and foremost to be real with themselves so how have you how have you evolved and taken the uh, the idea of selling from the heart where did you decide to go next what is the title of your next book oh wow um i'll, I'll take you all on a journey because this happened about three years ago yeah and if and if it wasn't for this moment three years ago i don't think the next book ever evolves mm. and i remember daryl amy's my podcast partner and you know daryl Ryan, because you've been on the podcast before. Yep. And we were sitting there one day with my business coach and his mentor. Mm -hmm. And we were all sitting together. We had met in the South in the United States and we we're having dinner together. And then that dinner progressed to when then we started to have some virtual meetings. We started to have some face to face meetings. And I remember this as plain as day. His business mentor says this. He goes, how can you look an executive in the eye and tell them that selling from the heart will help them grow their revenues and their profits? Because most, you know, we're in the B2B space. So, mo you know, most of the people that we're going to work with, we need to seek approval at the leadership level, at the executive level in order for us to come in to work with their VP of sales, their sales mm -hmm. team and things like this. Well, at the time, my business coach's mentor says this, you got a lot of great assets out there. Selling from the heart is a feel good brand. Once you understand what to do with your assets, watch what starts to happen next. Mm -hmm. And then he asked us this question. He goes, how can you look somebody in the eye and tell them selling from the heart can help them grow their business? What mm -hmm. are the core key foundations of selling from the heart? And almost instantaneously, I look at Daryl, he looks at me, and I said this, I go, selling from the heart, if people incorporate the principles behind it. Now, I'm going to make this sales-centric because that's the world that we live in, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. You go, if people can incorporate the foundation of selling from the heart, which is how you bring your authentic self to the forefront, they will build trust and they will build credibility in a sales world that is just starving for it. Mm -hmm. And right then and there, the lights went off. All of us go, you know what? You got to come up with the foundation of yeah, yeah, how yeah. to build trust and how to build credibility. And my business coach, a long backstory to this, but my business coach used to be on the security team for Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. And he specifically said, he goes, Larry and Daryl, people remember things in equations. It's something to do with how the mind works. Mm -hmm. He goes, if you can come up with a simple equation on how to build trust and credibility, layering in the core foundation of selling from the heart, you're onto something. Mm. Daryl and I grabbed a whiteboard and a bunch <laughs> of Sharpies and markers, yeah, yeah. and we went to town. And we go, what is it that we can come up with, which is the foundation of selling from the heart that would build trust and credibility? And it took us a little bit, 
But then I thought about chemistry for a moment. Yeah. And I don't know why it flashed in my head, Ryan. I was never really good at chemistry. I failed <laughs> it in college. Yeah. But it had the flashbacks. What happens if we made this like some equation where we had two letters, which I thought about chemistry? Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I just did. Silly as it sounds, this is what flashed through my head. And all of a sudden, we came up with the foundation of building trust and credibility, which is authentic relationships plus meaningful value. The accelerators on this or the multipliers are inspirational experiences mm -hmm. and disciplined habits. Mm -hmm. So the letters went AR plus MV times IE times DH. And we came up with it. And all of a sudden, they all just go, this is freaking brilliant. <laughs> Let's go. And right then and there, Ryan, we went to town and built coaching and training yeah. around how to incorporate those four facets into prospecting, how you work with your clients, and how you win more business. Mm. And for two years, we have been coaching and training some major sales teams across the United States. And I had no idea that that moment would define that was my next book. Mm. And that's how that's how selling in a post trust world came to be, was just a conversation that happened years ago, that turned into a brainstorming session, that turned into what it is, and the book's coming out, you know, here in a, in, in a couple of weeks as we're recording this. But it's Love taken it. the whole thank you. It's taken the whole foundation of selling from the heart, which I'm a massive believer. You got to go inward to go outward. We've had some deep conversations yeah. on this. Yeah. But if you want to build trust and credibility, you got to understand how to build genuine relationships. That's who you know. And you got to bring to the forefront what you know, which is meaningful value. Mm -hmm. And if you want to just put jet fuel on this, you have to bring an experience like none other, which we call an inspirational experience. But in order to bring an inspirational experience to the forefront, you got to drink from the cup of inspiration every single day. If you can't inspire yourself, you can't inspire others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the last part of this is you got to be massively disciplined with it. Mm -hmm. If you can do all of those, mark my word, you're on the road to sales success. Love that. Well, you might not be good at metabolic uh, by, uh, chemistry, but you certainly <laughs> have human chemistry nailed. <laughs> like you are a human chemist, my friend. Like Make no, make no doubts about hey, that's that. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah, yeah, you know what it takes to create human chemistry, that's for sure. One of the um one of the things that um obviously we've recently had Patrick Lencioni on the on the podcast recently and hopefully he'll be joining you soon as well. Um Pat, you know, talks about trust being the foundation of his five dysfunctions of a team. And you know, one of the, I think one of the things that made me think about this is that you you were talking the subtitle of your book is all about like the soft skills that yield the hard dollars. And sometimes and I think heart-centered leaders really need to hear this because there's a there was a there was a young, naive, immature side of me that was just like, why doesn't everybody just want to leave with the heart? I should I shouldn't have to convince anybody this is the right thing to do. And then I realized that actually a vast majority of the world values different things. So I need to meet people where they are, like a Trojan horse, right? I'll, I'll have to meet people at the world. Maybe it's the dollars uh that is the important thing and then like a trojan horse i will then be able to share this message and uh so our friend i don't know if i've introduced you to our great friend jason johnson but he's a a working genius certified and he was just saying to me last night how that is labeled a productivity tool right so business leaders are like great this is a productivity tool the trojan horse bit behind the working genius is that it's <laughs> it's a dignity tool is it yeah. is uh it's all about using and sharing your gifts so that you have more dignity like how how funny is that and um man i just i'm really like i've been fortunate to get an advanced copy of this this wonderful book and man i love the structure of it tell me about tell me about why you have structured it in the in the particular way what do you hope the experience your readers are going to have when they pick up this wonderful book oh wow it, it... The experience I, I want them to really think about is I want them to reflect on I'm, I'm big about mindset. Mm -hmm. So as somebody reads the book, there's going to be a lot of mirror moments. Mm -hmm. 
And I want them to think that Larry's sitting right next to them, reading the book and guiding them through the book. Mm -hmm. It's written in a very conversational way, mm -hmm. but it's written in a way that you're going to read a little bit. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to have you stop and I'm going to have you, and it's, this might be, it might be a highlighter moment or it might be pen and paper moment, or it might be a digital pad moment. But what I'm hoping that readers take away from this is not so much that everything they're doing is not correct. It's, it's not what, it's yeah, not yeah. what the book's designed to be. Yeah. But what the book's designed to be is you got to read this book with a mirror sitting right in front of you mm -hmm. and ask yourself at the end of each section, because it's sectioned out based on the trust formula. Yep. And at the end of every section, I want you to think about, am I building genuine, authentic, congruent relationships? That's mm -hmm. what I want people to really think through as they're reading the book. Because I know this, real relationships drive real revenue. <laughs> it really does. And at the end of each section, when it comes to meaningful value, I, 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 and it, I got to tie this into something that you said, especially when we start talking about meaningful value or substance, is this directly ties into the subtitle of my book. Mm -hmm. And it's the soft skills. It's discover, discover the soft skills that yield hard dollars. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a saying that I just dropped on the Selling from the Heart podcast one day. Just came out of just like, boom, it just came out of my head. But a lot of people will, for lack of a better word, will poo-pooey the term soft skills. They'll say it's yeah. necessary skills or they'll dance around. They'll call it people skills or human skills. People identify what soft skills. That's just, I'm just calling it what it is. We can glory it, right? This is like sales people who want to cover up, you know, that they're in yeah. sales with all these fancy titles. Hey, yeah. you're a salesperson. Be proud of it. Mm. But Why'd what I want aren't? somebody, what's that, Ryan? Why do you think people aren't? What's it? Pop, why why do you think people are shameful or not so proud of being a sales professional? I think because of all the negative connotations, how it's been portrayed throughout years mm -hmm. and throughout decades. Uh, they knew somebody who was in sales. They watched them and so forth. So I, I think it's I think it's how it's been portrayed. But if you go back, if you go back a hundred years plus, sales was a very noble profession. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because if we don't sell things, money doesn't move through the economy at the rate that it needs to. And it's why in selling from the heart, and I continue it in selling in a post-trust world, I always poke the bear that there's a difference between a sales professional and a sales rep. Mm. And what's really interesting about this now is I call them heart-centered sales professionals. And I want, I, I just have to go back to the soft skills that yield hard dollars because salespeople today, they have to have those tough business focused conversations. Mm. And I think a lot of times that's why a lot of people in sales get caught in the friend zone. They don't want to upset people, but yet I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of a book. And one of the books that really brings this to the forefront and I read it keeps, it's right to the left of me on my desk. It's called The Business of Honor. Mm -hmm. It's a great book. And it brings in uh it brings in a lot of spirituality, it brings in a lot of faith. But it also pokes holes at salespeople. And what's really interesting about this and it ties into what we're talking about Ryan mm -hmm. is they said people today must be willing to have assertive, healthy conversations. Mm -hmm. And being sales specific for a moment, you have to be able to look an executive in the eye, whether that's face-to-face -face or online, and you have to be willing to have those conversations that get somebody to think that may tug on their heartstrings. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of this. You got to bring the iron fist, but velvet glove. You got to be able to deliver a message in a very assertive way but also delivered in a very loving way. Mm. And that's why I think Iron Fist Velvet Club kind of sums up, discover the soft skills that yield hard dollars. So I want people to really unpack mm. that they can bring healthy, heart-centered, assertive business conversations. People want it, people crave it, and it's necessary to connect with somebody. Mm -hmm. 
what do you think are the you know because i you know i was reading um the forward i love to read the forwards and in the forward of this book was written by author mike weinberg and and he says that it's rare that a book is perfectly timed and precisely crafted to address a situation and he says that your book selling in the post trust world is perfectly timed to address the urgent critical and most important issue of the day trust like why is why why is there such an absence of trust and you know are people even aware of the cynicism that that we carry around most of the time you know it's just it's just unfortunate because um I, I think, in fact, post trust. I think post trust was the word of the year many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this, this is this is, in fact, it, it's so interesting that we're talking about this because just a couple of days ago, Daryl and I were talking about the cover of the book, mm -hmm. and we both firmly believe this is a book that's going to be around for a while because there's rampant skepticism running around right now. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the BS meters are at an all time high. If you look at reports back, right, five years ago, 10 years ago, whether, whether that be McKinsey reports or whether that, whether that be the Edelman report, everyone's talking about lack of trust. Mm. Everybody's talking about it. And, I, I, and, and unfortunately, well, fortunately for the book coming out at the right time, no one's really put their finger on how to do it, mm. how to really build it in a way that's easy to understand and that's not collegiate level. Yeah, yeah. And so many people, so many people talk about all these various ways to build trust. Yep. And I, I have to give a special shout out because it kind of ties into what we're talking about. I'm a big Dr. Henry Cloud fan. Mm -hmm. And I recently read his book. This is a couple months ago. And it is, it is interesting because the title of his book is called Trust. And it's the five pillars on how to build trust. And the first foundation is this. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you value me? Mm. And I want everyone to just stop and listen to that for a moment. Mm. If you want to build trust, this is a very polarized world right now. No one's really seeing each other. No one's really listening to each other. And no one's really valuing each other. And with those three things set aside, you're never going to build trust. A um a connection of mine shared this week how someone had done an AI version of her speaking, and it was like a crypto scam, and mm. it was just like, oh wow, like wow, like and if these things are happening all the time. We've got certain things going on in politics. We've got certain things going on in news media. All the things that happen in the various kind of crises of the world. And um, people don't know what to believe anymore. But I know what they will believe is the feeling of being in the presence of someone that comes to the world heart-centered. There's just a different frequency. There's just a different level of interaction. And I think that often means, and I'm really uh, glad that you, you put this in, is about shared experience. Because how do how do we know if anything's true? Well, I know the experience, and and that's the one of the main things. Right, we have all these things that say, eat this, do that, work out this time. All of the books are confusing because there's a massive information about do something different. But the one thing they should all be doing is inviting people in to have an experience. Like so, what this book is a playbook is is, is an invitation to say, go and have an experience of what your sales, you know. Uh, expression would be like if you did it this way and i and i think you know it's it's almost like whilst this is an, a playbook of a of a, a selling from the heart selling in a post-trust world authentic genuine there, there could also be a book that's the opposite and i think we would all intuitively understand that the opposite would lead to disaster right so why wouldn't we pick up this as a playbook and, and, and see what we can make possible with it and, and, and you know what's interesting about this? I, I, I got to go back to something that you just said, because I'm a massive believer, in, and I draw this out in inspirational experiences, Ryan, is, uh, and there's going to be some people that may doubt me on this, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I believe you're 100% responsible for how you show up. Mm -hmm. And I want us to stop and think about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you can control what you can control. You can't control what you can't control. 
So many people focus on the things they can't control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I want us to stop for a moment and just reflect. And then ask yourself, how are you showing up? That is what you can control. And I, and I just have to throw this out there. Uh, I believe selling in a post-trust world, even, even though it has the word selling in it. If you broke down the four foundations of how to build trust and credibility, it applies to people who aren't in sales. But by the way, everybody is in sales because <laughs> sales is influence. Yeah. So let's think if, if somebody decides to pick up selling in a post-trust world and they happen to be an accountant or they happen to be a lawyer or they happen to be in human resources or they happen to be in manufacturing, mm -hmm. the four foundations still play out. It's how are you building authentic relationships? Mm -hmm. Are they congruent? Does the walk match the talk? Mm -hmm. And in those relationships, are you bringing any substance to it? And in those relationships, are you bringing experiences that matter? It's how you show up. It's how you show up personally and professionally. Mm. And then are you coming to the forefront with discipline? Mm. And disciplined habits is the key to all of this. You can't build genuine, authentic relationships. You can't bring meaningful value. You can't bring an inspirational experience to anything unless you're radically disciplined with it. Mm. And so I believe that consistency in an inconsistent world is king and queen. Mm -hmm. You got to be consistent with all of this. I have a belief that um, we're all disciplined. We're all disciples of something. I think we're all disciples or we're worshipping some ideals, some virtues, some you know, whatever it is, um, and therefore our discipline. So people say, oh, I can't, I'm not disciplined. And I'm like, okay, well, let's just observe your life. Where are you disciplined? How many times have you picked up your phone in the last hour? How many yeah. times have you, you know, this, this, that. Uh, I think we are all disciplined. And I think when we really connect with the power of the heart, the qualities of the heart, the things that we're passionate about, the purpose that we have, the values that we have, you connect someone to that. Discipline, I believe, is the is the river that flows from that source. It's um because it's really really difficult to I think be disciplined to those things that just destroy your soul. You know that that that's like willpower alone. But it's not hard. It's not. It's it's less hard to be disciplined to do the. My daughter, she like she's nine years old, can't stop cartwheeling. She cartwheels yeah. everywhere. The girl doesn't walk. She's like cut. <laughs> I don't have to ask her to be disciplined in practicing her cartwheels. She does them. Why? Yeah. Because she loves it. It's a bit of an expression. It's, yeah. it's an expression of who she is. And I, and I think, you know, the first few chapters that you've got really lead you up to that point of, well, discipline will be the byproduct. When you really begin to be real with yourself and real with others and build your community and start sharing and adding value, I think the discipline is about what's keeping you on that, on that freeway. And, and it's why I, I really believe accountability and it's everyone's looking for, unfortunately, everyone's looking for the shiny object, the quick tip, the tactic, yeah, 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 yeah. get, get me to the promised land with minimal amount of work. <laughs> Guess what? Is that chapter seven? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, you know what? Life happens. It, there's going to be twists and turns, but here's the one thing that I do know, and maybe it's just ingrained in my DNA. I've always been disciplined. I've always held myself accountable. And I was never the smartest person out there. There's people way smarter than me, way, way, way smarter than me. But I, re I just remembered a long time ago, if I can't do the little things, if I can't do the little things correctly with discipline, with consistency and do those every single day, then I'm always going to be chasing, trying to cut corners with things. And I've always just taken that whole approach. I've taken that approach when I was in sales. I've taken that approach and how I built selling from the heart. It's I'm going to out-discipline anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be more consistent than anybody on the things that matter that move the needle. Mm -hmm. And I don't pay attention to things that don't matter. One of the things that I resonate with in the very early days of a lot of people's careers, they go for university, then it's like straight into this career rat race, right? 
and many people have their own goals of certain promotions, certain income by a certain age, right? And I don't mind, I don't know if you mind sharing me what age you were when you started selling from the heart. And because I think some people need to hear that actually what you're doing in those years, you know, the twenties and the thirties, you're actually building the character required to sustain the level of success that you're now bringing. I wouldn't have been able to sustain the level of success that you and I have achieved if I did that in my twenties. Why? Because I would have conflated that with my ego. Oh, um, yes, sir. On that one. I, I look, I look back and by the way, I mean, I'll, I'll be transparent on the age part of this. I, we started the selling from the heart podcast would have been 20 April, 2016 or 17. Mm -hmm. And I'll be 60 this year. Mm -hmm. So I started that podcast 52, 53. Yeah. And that's when this whole movement started. And if I would have started this, which goes right back to what you just said, if I would have started this in my 20s and 30s, there's no yeah. way. There's no way yeah. it would have flown. It probably would have fizzled out in about three or four months. But yeah. there's that age old saying that applies to this. With age comes wisdom. Yeah. And, and and the things that I'm bringing to the forefront now, yeah. I wish I would have done in my 20s and 30s. Hundred percent, and and that's is, and I and you, you say it might have fizzled out. It might have done the opposite. It might have gone wildly viral, wildly successful, and you would have burned it to the ground because you didn't know how to keep it. You'd have you'd have got you personally. I um when I get in my car and my phone decides to play whatever it wants to play and my yeah. car says, Oh, playing one of 20,000 songs. I'm like, all right, God, there's something you want me to hear in this moment. And it yeah. just came up out of the middle of nowhere. Uh, Eric Thomas, he was preaching. Um, uh, and he was basically saying is that uh, you all want my level of success. He says, yeah. but some of you haven't got the character to sustain this level of success. He said, your talent will take you places. Your character will not sustain you. And yeah. that's it. Some of some of us out there, in our younger years, there's a younger generation. They want the success, but actually, life hasn't given them the character to be able to sustain that success. So, you know, that's 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 a lesson, and there's some wisdom that you and I can share with people. Is that, you know, we've built these communities and platforms that, you know, I remember in my early days, it was taking me away from what was important. You know, I had a yeah. wife and young children. And, and and this was taking me away from those things that really really mattered, and I didn't have the wisdom to to see it at that point. And you know, so it's all character building for sure. Yeah, you, you you know what's interesting about this? I had I had no idea, Ryan, when when this when this whole thing started, what would happen. But now we we fast forward, so you know, here we are. The you know, I'll I'll use an American football terminology. The ball's crossed the fifty yard line as far as twenty twenty four has gone. Right, we're on the yeah, other yeah, side yeah. of twenty twenty four, and I pinch myself every day in the amount of people that raise their hand and self select them in and go, you know what. I've been yeah. following you for a long time. I've been following the message for a long time. It's about time somebody's been waving the flag around this. Mm. And, it, you know, it warms my heart. Yes. But I go, you know what? I'm just leading, you know, I'm leading my life. Daryl's leading his life in the exact same way. We're just two heart-centered guys that are helping the sales profession understand that when you connect to somebody's heart, that has a direct tie-in mm -hmm. to revenue and profit. Mm -hmm. And the only way this happens is you got to be willing to, I always say, you just got to be willing to let it go. I am no doctor. I am no psychologist, but I'm willing to go places that most people won't go because I'm confident in myself I believe in myself and I have high amounts of self-worth because I've done the work. Mm. I've done the work and I've learned more in my fifties than in my twenties, thirties and forties combined. Yeah. That's the, that's the compound effect. Yep. I love that. One of the, um, one of the things I think you and I both represent is this idea of, you know, it's a paradigm shift, right? And 
I think Simon Sinek does this wonderfully in his very famous viral TED talk, which is the law of diffusion of innovation, right? If you want to create a movement, there's the first two and a half of people that are in innovators, right? They're just, then you're early adopters and then you're early majority. So you got 17 and a half percent and about 37%. I think you and I are talking at the heart level, which is that early adopters. Like people go, yeah, that's a little bit, you said it's self-selecting identity, right? That's a heart level. And Jesus says that, um, Blessed are those who believe without seeing, right? And I think that's that. It's like, I get it at a heart level. There is something with the words you speak or the experiences I'm sharing with you. This is true. I trust and I yeah. follow. I willfully follow because I trust and I know that you speak well uh, and I know you speak truth. And then there's the next, there's the late majority. And I think this is really useful for people like you and I to remember, as well as those that choose to live and experience this way, is that, there are people that need to see to believe. Yeah. People need to see to believe. And for people to see to believe, it means that all those that get it at heart level have to have the courage to bring it to the world. Why? Because they are a shining example of what others know is possible, but they need to see it to believe it first. You know, I, I call them Debbie Doubters. Yeah. Right. And, and, and there's a lot of those out there. Yeah. And, and 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 I see it. I see it everywhere. There's people that are going to immediately wave the flag on this. Yay! I'm all in. I'm going all in. I'm just right. It is exactly. It's exactly what happened to me when I decided to start this movement. I just went all in. I just dove right in, and I just go. Yeah, I'm just going to yeah. bring this to the forefront. There's going to be a lot of people out there who this just doesn't resonate with. Mm. They might pay attention to it but they're really not going to pay attention to it. Mm. But mark my word on this. There'll be life happens and there'll be something that happens along the way. And they'll go, you know what? I can't run my life the way I've been running my life. Mm. And everyone's chasing. Everyone is literally chasing outer success. Mm -hmm. Everybody is. How many people are chasing the inner success? And that's the, that's the question that I want a lot of people to really think about. And I'm only bringing this to the forefront because in my twenties and thirties and forties, I was chasing all the outer success. Mm -hmm. Did you get it? Of course. Right. <laughs> yep. And the same could be said for you. The same could be said for anyone. If you're really open and you're honest about it. Mm -hmm. But here's what was interesting about this is as I define success, then once I got to that stage, it just wasn't good enough. I never really stopped to smell the roses because I was just, okay, now I'm on to the next and I'm on to the next and I'm on to the next. Until I said, man, I'm crashing and burning. And then it wasn't until I had to start looking inward. And, and this is this has been a journey. You've, you and I have had some deep conversations on it. And I was willing just to let go as I started bringing this message to the forefront and what's really been interesting is the one-off conversations I have with salespeople or the messages that I get coming back. And I never thought in a million years I'd get all of these, mm. but it's, it's the people are sitting on the sidelines. They'll get it sooner or later. They really will. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that, um, came up as you were speaking is this idea that um uh if you don't appreciate it more of the same will never be enough so if yeah. you don't appreciate what you've got more of the same will never be enough whether that be your relationships whether that be your health whether that be money more of the same will never be enough and i know that you talk about the power of gratitude within your book which is a you know generally in a, a spiritual mindset type kind of environment but bringing it into a sales professional and something really interesting happened to me a, a year or so ago where i sat back and i was like i only have a handful of clients you know I, I only ever work with up to about 12 people and i was just like i just had a moment of deeply held gratitude in my heart for these people because it's like they're paying for me. They're paying for me to live in my house and to feed my children. Yeah. And I was like, 
oh man i am supremely grateful for these people because there's a bit where you you know mentally you think well i'm the one serving you therefore you... but actually when you can posture your heart on being grateful for all that and then i wonder i wonder whether a sales world is so busy onto the next onto the next onto the next that we actually forget to be grateful for the ones that have already come with us oh there, there's there's so much gold in what you just said is if, if, if I look at this through a sales centric lens for just a moment and I apply exactly what you just said, how many salespeople out there, I want this is keen on this for a moment. How many salespeople are open, honest, transparent, and full of gratitude that they have their clients? Because without their clients, hmm. then what? I've always, I've, always, I've always shared this with everyone without any clients, you have no business. <laughs> they pay your bills mm -hmm. they really do and client your clients or customers however you all want to refer to them as they have choices they really have choices mm -hmm. and if you treat them like a transaction they will treat you like a transaction if you treat them as a human, if you treat them with love, respect, kindness, sincerity, that's transformative. They'll never let you go. They will never let you go. And I know this because I came out of a highly commoditized industry. I sold photocopiers for almost 30 years in Los Angeles, California. Yeah. yeah. And I was never the smartest person out there. Yeah. There was people that were way smarter than me that could wait, that could strategize beyond whatever I can strategize. But I caught on to this a long time ago. The faster I connected to the heart, the faster I made them feel comfortable about me, mm -hmm. the more experiences I brought to the forefront, mm -hmm. the more they remembered it, the more they repurposed those stories, the more they shared what it was like to work with me. Mm -hmm. that equates to long-term sustainability mm -hmm. and in an inconsistent sales world i'm going to urge everyone out there you got to find out what's going to create sales sustainability what's going to create sales sustainability is if you apply sorry for the shameless plug ryan but i'm going there you got to apply the the foundations of how do you build authentic relationships bring meaningful value to the forefront bring an inspirational experience and here's where i want to camp on this because i've always asked people if i had you to define what a customer experience is how would you define it and what's really interesting about this is People will say positive things about customer experience. They may even say negative things about customer experience because customer experience can go either way. It's really hard to have a negative inspirational experience. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. As silly as it sounds, it, it really is. Mm -hmm. So I want us to think, if you want to change your relationships, then think about the experience you're bringing, not just an experience. You got to bring an inspirational experience and you got to be really disciplined with it. If you do those things, you've carved out a niche like none other. It's not rocket science stuff. If somebody reads Selling from the Heart or somebody reads Selling in a Post-Trust World, there's nothing earth shattering that's in that book. It's not revolutionary. It really isn't. It's just things that we've all known forever and a day, but yeah. we've just lost our way with it. Yeah. And, and I think so much of the industry has been burned because there's been the sales professionals that have sold to meet their quota. And there has been some sort of manipulation. There's been some coercion, deception. There's been some sort of tactic that's led someone to buying something that they probably didn't want, need, or, or you know, the everyone that's read the um uh influence book by Cialdini, for example, that that use working on human short circuitry and yeah. psychology and you know, and I, and I don't think anybody wants to be coerced or manipulated into so I think people have a level of spidey sense and suspicion about being sold to. And I think there's a difference when, you know, someone as in a sales profession genuinely tries to find the intersection of what do we have and what do you need. 
and in a way, how do we serve you with what we have? And I think some of that comes to a point where you say, do you know what? I don't think we have got the solution for you. So nice to see you. Goodbye. You know, it, uh, and I wonder how many times sales professionals say, no, sorry, I, we're not the right fit for you. Because actually that's a paradoxical trust builder. Yep. I, I, I did it all the time. Mm. It took me a while to figure it out. Yeah. It really did. Yeah. And, and in selling from the heart, I expand upon it. And I really expand upon it in selling in a post-trust world is I'll, I'll just use some sales centric language for just a moment, but yeah. um, some of your listeners are going to get what I'm throwing down is if you want to have a full sales funnel, you got to build a full relationship funnel. <laughs> it's hard for salespeople to walk away from deals because there's not a lot in the funnel. So they hold on to everything and it may not be the right fit. Mm. And it's hard. It, 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 I, I look, I look, and I had to learn this the hard way. I really had to learn this the hard way. Is I wanted to build a tribe and I wanted to build a community of people who appreciated what I brought to the forefront. And the only way you're going to do that is you got to start taking a look at who you're doing business with. Mm -hmm. Do they, you all share the same mission? Do you share the same values? Mm -hmm. And, and I really, I really want people to hear this out, you know, especially those that are in sales. If the person you're talking to or the groups of people that you're talking to in the span of a few conversations, you can unpack this. Mm -hmm. If they don't share the same values, they don't have the same mission, their same philosophy in life, run the other way, run the other way. energy isn't it energy energy towards building uh, yeah i i i wonder larry if um you know at the undercover billionaire type tv shows where they put undercover billionaires back into a community and try and build up a yeah. billion i wonder if we were to drop you back into a sales profession and to deploy and implement all of the principles you talk about and share which what would you be what would you love and be most passionate about selling you know, products or services? Like, is there anything particular, if you were to be dropped back into a sales profession now, what you'd love to be selling? And you can't say your books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know what, you know, what's interesting? Cause I've, I've had, I've had somebody, somebody asked me this in, in a different way, but really what I'd, if, if I had to go back Right. I mean, I'm selling right now. Uh, you know, I'm selling obviously my philosophy and and obviously yeah. the books and coaching and training and things like that. But if I had to, if if I set that all aside, yeah, would I would I I would love to sell philanthropic work. I love giving back to the community. That's what lights mm -hmm. my fire. Mm -hmm. So if I went back into a sales capacity role. It would probably find a like-minded, like-hearted type not-for-profit organization where I could help sell their wares, their mission out in the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I think you know selling products is fine, but one of the things that just lights my fire, and again, if if I had to set all this aside, I'd go into not-for-profit work and sell that. Kind of alludes to the fact that you need to really believe in something or believing it. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I could talk to you all day, my friend, but I want to be super respectful of your time. What <laughs> do you hope the heart print of this book will be? You know, it lands in the hands of people and it just sparks a thought, a reflection, a new possibility in them that like much like that interaction you had three years ago where all things have you know, led off on a different path from that one moment. Larry, people are going to pick up this book, Selling in a Post-Trust World. What do you hope the heart print of this book will be? That it helps them become a better version of themselves. That it helps them build deeper relationships. That it helps them become more successful, however they want to define it. That it helps them become a better human. That it helps them leave people in a better place than when they first interacted with them. There, there's a lot of soul searching in that book. So I, I just, I just hope that at the end, when somebody picks up the book, they finish reading it, that they'll read it again and go, you know what? 
that was a really good book. I mean, that's the heart print that I'd really like to leave with people when they read that book, that when they get to the very last word on the very last page, when they close it, they go, I can't wait to read this thing again. It feels like selling from the heart's big brother feels like it's grown up it feels like it's got real deeper wisdom deeper if, if, yeah i don't know if that reflects you, to you, you yeah you know it, it's it's interesting that you say this um because if you if you choose to read selling in a post stress world and you've never read selling from the heart it's going to point you right back to selling from the heart mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if you've read selling from the heart and you read selling in a post stress world there's stamps of selling from the heart throughout the whole book. Mm. There, there really, there really is. But um, what's in it, what's interesting about this. And, and th this was a book that was long in the making yeah. selling in a post trust world. Just, a, just a sidebar before we wrap up is I'll, I'll give everyone a, a sneak peek into really what happened is I wanted to call this. I, just, I wanted to continue the legacy of selling from the heart. And so once I got enough inner fortitude to go, okay, I'm going to write another book. As corny as it sounds, Ryan, y'all, you're going to laugh. <laughs> yeah, I wanted yeah. to call this selling from the heart with a Roman numeral two on the book, <laughs> right? Like a Rocky sequel. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're Rocky. <laughs> and serious. And everyone kind of laughed at me, but I had my mind wrapped around it because I wanted to keep selling from the heart at the forefront. And it's like, you know, Daryl and my wife and all that go, that's just kind of corny, right? That's silly. And I will tell everybody who's listening or watching this, I wrote my whole entire next book, Selling in a post stress World, without a title. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it yeah. was serious. Yeah. Dead Maybe. serious. It yeah. wasn't until the book was done that the title was born out of what I wrote. Yeah, do you know what? Whether this is prophetic or whatever, like um, our good friend in common, Bob Berg, has a go-giver yeah. series of books, yeah. right? And they're all titled slightly different things, but I imagine you're going to have a series of these books um, that will inevitably selling from the heart series. Yeah, but but, but here's what here's the here's a nice thing: the brand stamped all over the book. So if you put up selling from the heart and selling in a post stress world, and you put them side by side. Same colors, same font, same yeah. everything. I mean, if somebody picked up selling in a post-trust world, they're going to go, you know what? I've seen this book before somewhere. It's selling from the heart. Happy days. Well, I look forward to the, the time and uh, we get to share time and space in real life, my friend. And it's going to um, happen one of these days. Just is, like you, just like you met face to face, our dear friend, Jonathan Darling. I remember seeing that video. It yeah. gave me goosebumps, dude. Yeah. Well, Jonathan's been putting a lot of videos on LinkedIn. Maybe we're just done with this. Like, yeah, he's he's a real character, isn't he? Like, I'm not sure I could have the confidence to be like shaving my head in the shower and talking to sales companies. Like, he's <laughs> he's having some really out there, brave, courageous, authentic. Like, it's incredible. I love it. I'm, I'm not sure I'm there yet. Like, what, what is? Does everyone need to be a little bit like Jonathan? Does everyone need to kind of find their own voice? Do you like what he's doing? Like. Maybe you could just provide some commentary on what you're observing on LinkedIn, what's working well. You know what? You got to be comfortable in your own skin. You, you really Literally. do. <laughs> you, you, seriously. You got to be able to carve out your own niche. Yeah. You you really do. And then, I mean, this is called what it is. Jonathan's comfortable. He knows who he is. It goes back to this. He's yeah. confident in himself. He believes in himself. And he's got high self-worth. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. What? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll have the link to that video in the show notes for those who are curious to see Jonathan in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, absolutely love having you on the show again for the second time. We'll, we'll obviously have you back for a third time to complete the uh, the trilogies. You know, uh, that would be uh, awesome. Thank you. I re well, I really appreciate. It. By the way, thank you for entrusting me with you know in this this time together with your audience. I really appreciate it. Well, that's because we have an authentic relationship. We have, what's the rest of the formula that I've read? <laughs> we have the full formula. There's no wonder we trust each other. Yeah. We've had some great experiences together. Yeah. Meaningful value, authentic relationships, 
and we've had some wonderful uh and we're both disciplined in the habits that we have in our podcasting so this was just inevitable there you go there you go uh we're not going to get to number five though because everybody knows that rocky five is the worst oh <laughs> but 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 I, I will tell you this i think there's i think there's another book in me it's just not right now yeah, it, it it's swirl it's swirling around in my head where I can take the foundation of selling in a post stress world, but it's just this was a long undertaking. Writing the second book was just it, it, I did mental gymnastics around this book because yeah. it, it I had a lot of imposter syndrome in writing it because I go what happens if I write this book and it tarnishes the reputation of selling from the heart? Yeah, yeah. You but you write- I believe this book is way better than selling from the heart. It's great. It's an advancement on it. And, you know, well, who's to say the world might need a uh, a politics in a post-trust world or a, or a oh, politics, I, I, okay. or a politics I'm not gonna, from that? <laughs> that, that? Okay, Ryan Hartley, that's where I'm going to draw the line on that one. <laughs> politics from the heart. I'll tell you what, the world needs it, my friend. So oh. you know, if only someone had the formula for it. Oh, yeah. You've been, you've been convicted. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Larry, do you have any final thoughts for us, my good friend? Um. Yeah, I, I I would I would just say uh, it, it's it's something that I read. Uh, in fact, they're right here on note cards. Nice. And I I just want to leave people with this because this this is something that I read every single day. And this is this has helped me get through how to really build selling from the heart in the way that I have built it. Mm. It's. Uh, and you're, and you're going to recognize this, mm-hmm. but it's Matthew 7, mm-hmm. chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And I read this every single day. And it's ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. And so what I want people to think about is you got to ask. Because if you ask not, you get not. Mm-hmm. And you got to seek, and you got to continually be seeking, seeking to become better. And you got to keep knocking on doors because if you stop knocking on doors, you're going to stagnate your growth. Mm. So that's what I want to leave people with. That's something I read every single day. Yeah. I love that. Larry, appreciate you, brother. I appreciate oh, you. Before you go, the, uh, the book is due for release August 13th available for pre-order. Where, where would you like people to go pre-order it from website? Uh, Amazon. Well, they could they can pre-order it from wherever fine books are sold. So, well, I'll let people get creative creative on wherever fine books are sold. Special shout out to my publisher on that one. Uh, you can if you want to find out more, you can go to sellingfromtheheart.net. Yeah. Uh, if you want to find out even more, you can go sellinginaposttrustworld.com. Love that. And um, in terms of business owners that are listening, any any executive leaders, and they're thinking about what might selling from the heart look like in their organization, how might they get your services, coaching? Is it one-to-one coaching? Is it courses? Like, what is it that um, they can go to the website and find out more about? Yeah, you could, you could, you can find out how you can interact with us. Just go to sellingfromtheheart.net. Yeah. And there's pages directed at CEOs. There's pages directed at sales leaders. There's pages directed at sales professionals. You can find out what we bring to the table and how you can engage with us. Just go to sellingfromtheheart.net and you can find out anything you want to find out about how we can work with each other. Love it. Larry, good luck with the uh, with the launch. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure this is going out in time for people to get a pre-ordered copy and uh, share in it man, and, and, and uh, keep bringing that kingdom that you bring into this world. I appreciate you, man. Uh, I'm super grateful. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, my friends. Thank you for making it to the end. I hope that our time spent together today has left you a little bit better than before you push play. I'd really appreciate if you just took a moment to leave a review to allow me to meet more people where they are and hopefully leave them a little bit better too. If you're curious to know how I, through Always Better Than Yesterday, can serve you, your team, your organization, then head to alwaysbetterthanyesterday.com to connect. And while you're there, let me know one or two things that you're going to do as a result of listening to this conversation. I absolutely love hearing your thoughts, your reflections, and the things that this spark in your own heart and mind. If you want more insights from my heart and mind, I do send out short episodes on a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And again, I hope that they serve you well. 
I appreciate you listening. I'm Ryan Hartley, host of the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast, a podcast for heart-centered leaders just like you. Keep leading, my friends. Always love.